Well, good evening, everyone. Hope you're all keeping okay and safe and well. And uh, we're going to look forward tonight, God willing, to um, having a look together at Revelation chapter 10. Let's uh, see how we get on. Let's do a quick recap. So, so Revelation chapter 1, Lil. Multitudinous Christ. Multitudinous Christ. In chapter 2 and 3, we've got the Ecclesias. See if you can rattle through them for us, Lils. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Top job. Okay, chapter 4, we have the vision of the... Throne. Vision of the throne, which moves through into chapter 5. And in the middle of that throne, the one who's now able to open the scrolls is revealed. And that one is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the lamb. The lamb. Uh, and the reason that the scrolls can be opened is the work of the lamb. And so chapter 6, we see that the lamb opens the scrolls. And the, the scrolls, as they're open, show us the history unfolding from the time that John is given this remarkable prophecy um, all the way through to our own. So the first scroll that gets open, Mills, um, deals with the Roman Empire, and it's a time of peace. peace. So that's symbolized by a white horse. white horse. Then after the white horse comes the red horse. time of bloodshed. After the red horse comes the black horse. A time of famine. And after the black horse comes the... The pale horse or the Chloros. the chloros horse, and that is a time of death. disease and death. That's right. Yeah, excellent. So then we see this picture at the end of chapter six, which looks like the kingdom as the heavens are unfolded, the, uns the, 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 the unfurled, and we see this kingdom picture. But we soon discover it's not the kingdom at all. Actually, it's because pagan Rome had collapsed. And it had been changed by which man? Constantine. Constantine. And it changed pagan Rome to be Christian, Christian Rome. Excellent, yeah. right? So Christian Rome. And for a while, for, for many of the true believers, it was a time of quietness that must have been amazing to them. Sadly, they recognized very quickly that the Roman system, the, the, the Christian Rome that was emerging, was far from the truth which the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples had taught. So chapter 7, rather beautifully, gives us a break from this history unfolding. And for the believers, what a exhortation support it would have been, because it was a vision to them of the 144,000 and an innumerable number of saints that would be able to be in the kingdom because of the Lamb. Chapter 8, then, the history carries on, and the breakup now of the western leg of the Roman Empire, and it was broken up how? Barbarians. The barbarians. So the trumpet sound. And the first trumpet was which barbarian? Alaric the Goth. Alaric the Goth. And then um, uh, after Alaric the Goth, who do we have next? Well, on Ilse, can the Vandal, and then Attila the Hun, super job. And then, which man is credited in the history books with the fall, ultimately, of Rome itself, the city of Rome? It was Odoacer, the, the Visigoth. So, we've got there the fall of Western Rome in chapter 8. Then chapter 9, which we looked at last week, we see now Eastern Rome. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's image, the two legs of the empire. So the Western leg has fallen in chapter 8. The Eastern leg now we're going to concentrate on in chapter 9. And we have the rise of which major world religion? Islam. Islam. So the star at the beginning of chapter 9 was who? Muhammad. Muhammad. And... Uh, my, my family got in contact with me after last week's class um, and said, Pete, you did not explain very well at all um, the, the, the pit and the abyss. So uh, I was really grateful that um, Brother Bernard Burt, who's um, one of my best pals, uh, he, he very kindly sent me notes as he does every week. And he's so lovely. And he, he said to me, Pete, let me give you a map. So he's given me a map. Let me put it for you on the screen. So this isn't mine, but I felt really irritated, if I'm honest, when he sent it me, because 
in one map, he was able to make clear what I stumbled around with and didn't make very clear for 10, 15 minutes or so. So I apologise profusely, but we've got Uncle Bernard to thank for kindly sending me this. So that, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 9, just open your Bibles there again. Let's just make this absolutely clear for all of us. That when we see that the star Muhammad was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit. At the end of verse 2, we read the smoke of the pit. That word pit, when we see it used elsewhere, and we're not going to go into all that again, don't worry, we understand it's the shaft, it's the way. I put on the uh, screen last week a picture of a well, and the well shaft, and the, the word pit is the idea of the way, or the shaft. And so what is opened up, is the shaft to the abyss. Um, now, uh, uh, Uncle Vic Orcott, Brother Vic Orcott, also kindly emailed me in a week and said, Pete, you had one of your references for the abyss wrong. I have chapter 18, verse 8. He said it's not chapter 18, verse 8, it's 17, verse 8, which is absolutely right. I, uh, my fat fingers pressed the wrong number. So they're the correct references on the screen if you need to do a quick update in your margin but all those references to the abyss talk to us of the territory that the beast of the sea comes out the the roman system so the abyss is there in the circle um uh, uh the, the the oval i perhaps should say there over france and italy and sort of central europe and what muhammad is able to do is he's given the key to the shaft of the abyss to the way to Rome and so over the next hundreds of years the, um, uh, the the Saracens the Muslims came up and in the first instance through North Africa um, uh, and uh, Israel and Syria um, and they came we, we see in the year 732 into that territory um, of the abyss and then actually they came the rest of revelation chapter 9 shows us that they came through turkey in 1453 we saw the eastern leg of rome fall uh, of constantinople and on they moved to to the abyss um, that central section of the roman empire so i what i suggest that perhaps you do if you've got a phone or something like that take a photograph of that um uh, picture i was very grateful that um brother bernard sent it to me and what a help that is i hope to, to you as well in much more clearly than i was saying um seeing what we're what's taking place here now brother bernard also sent me another quote which i think is really uh, interesting which truth is i had before but I, but i i should have shared last time and i didn't but all the same i i want you to look at this on the screen do you remember in Revelation 9 and verse 4, where it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing? <clears throat> now, look what Abu Bakr, the first caliph, said in his speech to his troops. He said, remember, you're always in the presence of God. Let not your victory be stained with the blood of women or children. Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of corn. Cut down no fruit trees. Isn't it interesting? The language that's being used when we see the symbol there of the grass. Nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat, you will find. People that belong to the synagogue of Satan who've shaven crowns, be sure you cleave their skulls. Now, just note what he's saying, that they, they've got shaven crowns. And look at the description in contrast that we know is talking to us about the, 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 the Muslims as they spread north and west. In verse 8, they're described as having the hair of women. So isn't it so interesting that that speech captures some of the, the symbology that we see in chapter 9? Okay, so we're going to um, look tonight at Revelation chapter 10 which we'll read shortly but I just want you to notice where we're at to uh, or where we're at that sounded a bit Welsh then, didn't I where, I, where we're at to um, <laughs> this is where we're at we're, we're looking aren't we now at the thunders 
of Revelation chapter 10. And they bring us right up to the period of the millennium. And so we've been through the seals of Revelation 6, the trumpets of chapters 8 and 9. We'll come to the vials in chapter 16 in a few weeks, God willing. But tonight we're going to look at the seven thunders of Revelation chapter 10. So let's read it together. Um, and uh, and then, we'll, then we'll start to unpick it. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His feet was as it were the sun, and his feet, uh, his face rather, was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in my mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Okay, thank you guys. So I'm going to um, just stop sharing my screen a second. And... speak um and and then i'll ship, put my screen back on um in, in a few moments time so let's just look together at what we've just read we, we notice don't we that chapter 10 once again gives us a vision now after we've read some history and so in the same way that do you remember that the end of chapter six when we'd read all about pagan rome collapsing we were then given a vision in chapter seven that we understood that Constantine was not the solution. That none of the saints who were reading their Bibles would find themselves thinking, uh, you know, after a little bit of time, they might have thought, well, you know, Constantine, he's changing pagan Rome, he's making it Christian, he's our man. But they quickly learned that he was not. And chapter 7 gave them a vision of the kingdom age. And now we've got just the same. Now, chapter 8, Western Rome's collapsed. Chapter 9, Eastern Rome has collapsed. And lest any begin to think that, that Islam is the solution, because they believe, don't they, in one God, just like Christadelphians, they don't believe the Trinity. And lest any get caught up thinking, well, this must be the solution. This is what God has promised. No, far from it. Chapter 10 now once again transports us to look at a vision of the kingdom. And so we read in verse 1 that John saw another mighty angel. Now, we only come across this phrase of the mighty angel on three occasions in the book. So should we just make a note? In chapter 5, we come across the mighty angel in chapter 5 and verse 2. Now, if you've got an authorised version, it will say strong angel. It's the same Greek word where you remember that the strong angel was not able to loose the seals. It took the lion of the tribe of Judah. It took the slaughtered lamb to open the seals. So that strong angel which represents to us the mighty ones of the saints. No one, 
not even the angels, not anyone alive, not anyone dead, not the angels. No one could open the seals save the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's where we came across a strong angel. And then we come across the strong angel or a strong angel again in chapter 18. Do you want to just turn there? And verse, so chapter 18 and verse 21, where we read that a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And so we see here again the mighty angels, the saints, who will destroy Babylon. It will be utterly destroyed as it's thrown into the sea. So in chapter 10, when we read of this mighty angel, come down from heaven, clothe the cloud, we're going to have a picture of the saints. So let's just use a couple of Old Testament references to help us back this up. Will you come to Zechariah chapter 9? So I'll keep you a marker in Revelation 10, but coming back to Zechariah chapter 9, where we read of these mighty ones, in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 13, we read of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints as they come to Zion. And we read in verse 13, When I've, when I've bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. Or chapter 10 of now, Zechariah, verse 5. They shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the street. This is a mighty angel. This is me and you, we hope. As mighty ones who are going to go forth to tread down the enemies in the mire of the streets. They shall fight because Yahweh is with them and the riders on horses shall be confounded. I will strengthen the house of Judah. I'll save the house of Joseph. I'll bring them again. And so the mighty angel is going to go out. It, it's, it's the picture of the saints who are to go out um, under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord and will subdue the nations as we march to Jerusalem. But just one more, perhaps. Come to Joel, Joel chapter 3. It's always bad news, isn't it, when you're doing a class and you ask people to turn to these references, which uh, take me about three days to find myself. I need to uh, get these cracked. So Joel chapter 3. Hope you're there. Joel 3 and verse 9, we read, Proclaim ye this among the na nations. Prepare war. Wake up. The mighty men. These are the mighty ones. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come near. Beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. And so it's the picture of the march to Armageddon. We read on, put ye in the sickle, the harvest is ripe. Come get down, the wine press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And so come back to, to Revelation chapter 10. It's of great significance that this is the mighty angel. This strong angel is showing us what we will be as mighty ones. And the symbology you see very quickly includes us. The mighty angel came down from heaven clothed with a cloud. Now, where else have we come across a cloud in the book of Revelation? Can you remember? Um, well, Beth just said one. I think she might have said 21, but I was thinking just chapter one. So come on, let's have a look at chapter one. 
<laughs> Do you remember in verse 7, when we see the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes with clouds. And so do you remember that we had to look at who the clouds were? Let's just look at a couple of additional references. So I'm going to suggest to you that next to the word cloud in Revelation 10 and verse 1, you put Revelation 1 and verse, um, what verse was it? Was it 7 or 8? Seven. Verse 7. So put Revelation 1 verse 7, Rev 1 7. Another reference would be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So let's turn there. 1 Thessalonians 4. And verse 17. We find it. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together to meet them in clouds. And that this symbol, what's what this idea of the clouds? Well, the real solution comes for us in Hebrews chapter 12. So Hebrews 12, we read verse 1. Laying aside, therefore we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us. We're compassed with a great cloud of witnesses. It's the saints, it's the people. So this angel, Revelation 10 verse 1, is clothed with a cloud. What references have we got? We've got Revelation 1 and verse 7. We've got 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17, and we've got Hebrews 12 and verse 1. All right? So, he's clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. So we've got this picture of the rainbow. Now, you remember, don't you, how the rainbow is formed. For a rainbow, you've got to have what? Sun and rain. Sun and rain. How do you get the rain? From the... So for a rainbow, you've got to have sun, clouds, and rain. Well, we've seen that what the clouds represent. The clouds show us Same. the saints, the people. What about the sun then? His face is like the sun. Look, verse 1. Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. His face is shining as the sun. Um, we, we, we think of references like Malachi chapter 4 and verse... What verse is it, folks? Come on. Someone tell me. Malachi 4, verse 3 or 4, is it? Let's have a look together. Malachi 4 and verse, well, I'm wrong, both of them. Verse 2. We read, don't we, of the, the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of Righteousness arising. So we've got here, haven't we, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, 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 the picture of the Son, uh, Malachi 4 and verse 2. And another lovely reference is 1 John 3. And verse 2, because this picture of, is of the mighty angel, the saints. So 1 John 3, verse 2. Now, now we're all the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So as his face shines as the sun, so does this strong angel with face shining as the sun. So we've got the sun, the picture of the Lord Jesus. We've got the clouds, the witnesses. Now, for the rainbow to come, we also need the rain. And we looked at this previously, and we had a reference from Psalm 72, didn't we? Do you remember? that the, the rain upon the mown grass, that was the picture in Psalm 72 and verse 6. So the idea of the rainbow, Psalm 72, verse 6, we've got the sun, the rain, uh, another reference that we looked at briefly last time was actually again in Joel. I should have asked her to keep a marker, shouldn't I? I'm sorry. Just go back to see the rain again in Joel. So, in Joel chapter 2, we read in verse 23, be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He's given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. But it's just interesting that the, the margin 
tells us of this picture of the rain, that it's the idea, when it says the former rain, look in your margin, verse 23, the former rain, what does the margin say? Joel 2, 23, the former rain, what have you got on the margin? Joel 2, 23. So I, it's, it's not the margin I want as a reference. The authorised version margin tells us that phrase former rain means a teacher of righteousness. Okay? So you got it there? Yeah, it does say actually. Yeah. So this picture then, which we've got of the rainbow as the sun, the, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ is shining through the rain, through the teaching of righteousness. So this rainbow appears. It's a rainbow made from so many. His face was with the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Well, we've seen feet as pillars of fire already. Once again, back in Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation 1, 15, you've got his eyes like fire. And then in verse 15, his feet were unto fine brass, burned in a furnace. So this angel is going forth with judgment. The fire of judgment is coming from his feet. As we saw in Zechariah chapter 9, he's going to stamp on the heathen as the angel marches out. And another reference to, to just make a note of, actually it's 2 Thessalonians again. I say again, we haven't been there, have we? But 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 7 to 9, I've got in my margin, next to the flaming fire. So, so I'm, I've circled pillars of fire and I've put a note in my margin, 2 Thess 1, 7 to 9. Let me read it to you now. And to you who are troubled, um, uh, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Note that, what's the phrase? The mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. This is us. It's me and you. As we march out, and the picture is the rainbowed angel. And so that's why... Many of you will have heard this uh, lovely phrase, I think, of the rainbowed angel or the march of the rainbowed angel. It's the picture of the saints following the judgment or following the resurrection, then the judgment. And the immortalized saints now are going to fulfill the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of the Father, as we leave. The, the place of the judgment, which we'll look at shortly, and we go out. And the picture is of a rainbow angel. We're all unified together, even though we may have different jobs to do, different battles to be won. We're going to be moving out as one force and one body. So we then see in verse 2 that this mighty angel had in his hands a little book open. Well, who was able to open the scrolls? Let me ask the question. Who opened the scrolls? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb. The mighty angel couldn't open the scrolls. But this mighty angel has got a little book open. There's just a little book. It's just of a short period of time. The suggestion, actually, is that it's a jubilee period. About 50 years, uh, Brother Sully, um, writing in his book, The Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy, in the second chapter, shows from Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 40, that 
uh, he believes that the events leading up to the building of the temple, which of course we see in Ezekiel 40, are based on a jubilee period from the time of Josiah's great Passover, 50 years um, until the building of the temple. And so uh, I wouldn't be dogmatic in that, but I think it is helpful for us to realise that the work of the rainbowed angel isn't something that just in a flash, suddenly the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and then the kingdom of God is set up and boom, you know, it's all done. It's not like that. There's a work of many years to be done from the time of the judgment, which the suggestion is, is a 10 year period in itself, um, uh, all the way through to the, the different battles and the work of the rainbow angel as it moves up to Israel and, and the kingdom gets set up and established um, that it, it's a period of some years um, in which these events unfold. But in the fullness of time, of course, it's just a little book compared to the scrolls that the Lord Jesus Christ unfolded, which gave hundreds and hundreds of years of history. So he's got the little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. So the sea is the picture of the, Nation. the nations. The earth is the picture of Rome. the Roman Empire. So that's, that's the picture we've got that carries on. Um, some may say, well, it, perhaps it's the beast of the earth or the beast of the sea, which we have in chapter 13, which is the different sort of uh, sections of the Roman Empire. But needless to say, this picture of his right foot and his left foot being on the earth and the sea, quite clearly he's treading down the nations as he's moving up to Jerusalem. Then we read that he cried, verse 3, with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. Well, where have we come across the lion before in the book of Revelation? Uh, chapter 5, chapter 5. Chapter 5, on a little, the lion of the, the of lion of the tribe of Judah. So his voice is now the conquering lion. It's not the lamb, is it? The work of the lamb has been accomplished, but now the lion of the tribe of Judah roars. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And the rainbowed angel's role is to deliver these seven thunders. Now, we understand, don't we, that the, the picture of the thunders is this picture of war, of seven thunders. But we notice, don't we, this idea of the seven thunders uttering their voices. And I asked you um, for homework last week to um, see if you could find the Old Testament reference that we think this is drawing from, the seven thunders uttering their voices. Uh, any ideas over here, guys? Didn't, Didn't do the homework. No. Absolute letdown. <laughs> All right, so I wonder how many did do their homework. The, the, the reference I would suggest that you put in your margin next to verse three is Psalm 29. All right, it's probably already in your margin. Um, it's, that, it's not actually in mine, but all the same, it's, it's, some of you may well have it. Psalm 29. So let's have a look there at this lovely psalm. It's a psalm of David, and we read, it says, Give unto the Lord, O ye, who? Mighty. O ye mighty. So who are we talking about? In Revelation 10, verse 1, what have we got? We've got the mighty angel. Give to the Lord, O ye mighty. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord, or the voice of Yahweh, is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. What have we got in Revelation 10 and verse 3? We've got seven thunders. thunders. The God of glory thunders. Now, why is this so significant? In verse 3, 
Starts with what phrase, Lil? So Psalm 29, verse 3, starts with what phrase? Psalm 29, and verse 3, the what phrase? The, the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord. Verse 4, how does it start? The voice of the Lord. What's the next phrase after that? The voice of the Lord. Verse 5. The voice of the Lord. Verse 7. The voice of the Lord. Verse 8. The voice of the Lord. Verse 9. The voice of the Lord. Well done, Lil. How many times did you just say the voice of the Lord? Seven. Seven. What we told in Revelation 10 and verse 3? Seven thunders uttered their voices. So the, the voice of Yahweh is on the waters. The God of glory thundered. Now, what's the picture of waters in the book of Revelation? When we read about the, the, the voice of the Lord being on the waters, what does the waters speak to us of? What's the symbol? Nation. The nations. So who's in control of the nations? The Lord, right? And we read everything that the Lord is doing. And then we read in verse 10, the Lord sits upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sits king forever. Now I'm just going to share my screen again. We're just interested, aren't we, to see this phrase in Psalm 29 and verse 10, when we've read about the seven voices of the Lord, that the Lord sits on the flood. Because if I'd asked you at the beginning of the class where we come across a rainbow, where would you have taken me? Genesis. To Genesis, to the story of the flood. We'd have all said to go there, wouldn't we? We'd have all said, you know, come to Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, where we read about the flood and the covenant that God gave to Noah, which was the rainbow. So just let's note, I've put there on the screen some connections for us. In Revelation 10, we read about the, the cloud and the rainbow and the seven thunders uttering their voices. When we compare that to Genesis 9, where we read about the, the rainbow, we also read that the waters will no more become a flood to destroy all flesh because the Lord sits on the flood. That idea then of the waters, that reference there of Isaiah 57, 20 or Revelation 17 where we read in Isaiah about the wicked being like the troubled sea, or in Revelation 17, we read of the woman sitting on many waters, that what we're being shown is that the work of the rainbow angel, we're going to destroy the heathen, but it won't be like it was in the days of the flood. The Lord is in control of the waters. That, that, that will be destroyed but it won't be as it was in the days of the flood. So in Psalm 29, we've just looked at, it's, I just want you to make a note while we're here, that where we read of the Lord sitting on the flood, that really is the flood. That Hebrew word is used on 13 occasions, 12 of which are in the Genesis record. This is the only one outside the Genesis record. It's talking about the flood. And yet... We now, as the rainbowed angel, are going to walk out. And although the nations represent those troubled waters, we're going to be able to walk on them. We know the picture from elsewhere in Revelation, don't we? That the, the sea is going to become like a sea of glass as we walk on them. They won't need to be destroyed in the way that all of the earth was destroyed, except eight people in the time of Noah. So come back to um, Revelation chapter 10, if you're not already there. Because we see in verse 4 that when the seven thunders uttered their voices, we think, oh, great, we're going to be shown the battle plans of what's going to take place when the rainbow angel goes out and marches up to Jerusalem. And John is just about to write down what he's seen from the seven thunders. 
And I heard a voice from heaven, verse 4, saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And so John is not able to give away the battle plans, as it were, of the Lord God. The, the book of Revelation shows us more than enough for us to try to understand in sign and symbol. We're not told of what the work of the rainbowed angel will be. Other parts of scripture give us clues, which if we've got time, we're going to try and piece together uh, this evening. But in the book of Revelation, we're not told exactly what will happen when the seven thunders utter. So verse 5, we read that the angel which I saw stand on the sea and on the earth, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swear by him that lives forever and ever. Now, what have you got in your margin next to that phrase? Lifted up his hand, right hand to heaven and swear by him living forever and ever. I've got Daniel 12 and verse 7. So my suggestion is that you perhaps make a note. Daniel 12 and verse 7. We'll go there shortly. Let's just finish reading verse 6. He swear by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. The word time is the word delay. There'll be no more delay. Time is up. Acts chapter 17, verse 31 is a good reference to put next to time no longer. The Lord God has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. There is a day appointed. And all of us need to be mindful of that, that there is going to come a time when there will be delay no longer. The angel sounds. And time's up. And you know, for all of us, particularly young people, we've been really thrilled in our house this week, and I know that uh, many of you are able to join with us. Um, as Lily was baptized, and we were just absolutely thrilled with so many brothers and sisters across the world and, and the angels in uh, her committing to that. But you know, all of us, you know, it's not a question of being baptized, is it? And then thinking, well, I'm done now. You know, that's me sorted. If you're not baptized and you're of an age of responsibility, it's something you, I'm sure many of you, in fact, I know some of you are giving thought to and being instructed in. That's the right thing to be doing. But equally, for those of us who are baptized, many of us for many, many years, I mean, Uncle Vic Orcott's watching this. Uncle Vic's about 150. <laughs> and uh you know he's been baptized for a long long time right but uncle vic will be the first to say that actually just because we've been baptized doesn't mean that we're set for the time when the lord jesus christ returns we've got to each day be thinking we need to live this day as if it's our last to give it our best because tonight might be the time when the angel sounds and there will be time no longer. How have we used today? Perhaps more importantly now, how are we going to use tomorrow? Let's make sure we use it wisely. That when that sound is given and there will be time no longer, there will be no more delays. We'll be ready to the best of our ability despite all our failings, to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I ask you to make a note in your margin of Daniel chapter 12. Did you do that next to verses 5 and 6? Daniel 12 and verse 7. While I take a sip of water, let's turn there. Daniel 12 and verse 7. Now, I think there's some remarkable things here, some of which I think will be a bit challenging for us to try to go into too much detail for. But let's see, I might just mention a couple of things. And for those of you who know these chapters very well or know your Bibles really, really well, 
It might just give you something very quick to think about. So Daniel 12 and verse 7. I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up the right hand and his left hand to heaven, swear by him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So Daniel was uh, writing at the time when there would be time. Now in the book of Revelation, there is to be time no longer. But can you see that the language of Revelation 10, 5 and 6 picks up on the language of Daniel 12 and verse 7. The, the, the right hand, the left hand, swear by him that lives forever and ever. And this time it's that there will be time, times and a half. Now, we haven't introduced this concept yet. In fact, we'll probably look at it next week or particularly when we come to chapter 12. Uh, the week after, chapters 11 and 12, we're going to really have to get our heads around some time periods. But time, times and a half, we believe is related to a very specific time period that's then used on different occasions and talking about different sections, but all the time about a very specific length of time. So what is it? Well, time, a year. So one year, times, two years, half a time, half a year. So what have we got? We've got one, add two, add a half. How much all together? Three and a half. We've got Bex a mathematician. She's so good at this, <laughs> right? Three and a half. But actually, we now start to use our prophetic brains. And we go, well, time, this year, that relates to 360 days in the Jewish calendar. So 360 days is time. You don't well, you haven't got to remember all this now or note all this now. I just want to tell you something interesting. So time, 360 days. Times, what would 360 times two be? Yeah. Thanks for giving up on that. Wait. 360 times two? Seven. 20. Seven. Excellent, Boo. So we've got 360. We've now got 720. What's half a time? What's 360 and a half? 180. Beck jumps up. She's so chuffed. <laughs> so what have we got? We've got 360, 720, and 180. When we add all those three things together, has anyone got a calculator on your phone? Add it up. 360, 720, 180. It comes to... 1,260. Beck is so sharp. One... Two six zero one thousand two hundred and sixty one thousand two hundred and sixty days. We then apply a day for a year, and what have we got? One thousand two hundred and sixty yes. years. Now, many of you won't have followed any of that, don't worry. But we've got a time period of one thousand two hundred and sixty years. Next week, God willing, when we look at Revelation 11, we're going to see this time period being used in different places. But here's one for you. Charlemagne created the Holy Roman Empire, which we'll look at in Revelation 13 uh, in a few weeks, God willing. The Holy Roman Empire, the beast of the earth, the Holy Roman Empire. What year, can any remember, do we come across Charlemagne? A.D. 800. <laughs> I think the quick answer to my question was no. <laughs> so Charlemagne, it was AD 800. And that was a period that the Holy Roman Empire began. You look at that up tonight. Charlemagne, AD 800, when he creates the Holy Roman Empire. Why is that significant? Well, add the time period. Add 1260 onto it. 800, add 1260, what do you get to? 2060. 2060. What year are we in right now? 2020. 2020. Why is that interesting? This is talking about a little book. The suggestion is that perhaps, and by the way, I wouldn't be in the least bit dogmatic about this. The truth is we don't know the day or the hour when the Lord Jesus Christ will come. It, it's hidden from us. We don't know. We're not told about the seven thunders. But it is interesting 
that when we think to ourselves, well, we have that time period of 1260 to AD 800, which when we get to Revelation 13, we'll see we have reason to be able to do that it brings us to the year 2060. And perhaps, perhaps that's a period when uh, the Roman Empire, once again, Rome will be utterly destroyed. Now you might say, well, 2060 before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, I can't wait another year. Don't forget that we think we might be looking at a jubilee period of 50 years. So the Lord could come tonight. The Lord could come tonight. And we still have plenty of time for that jubilee period to be fulfilled before the year 2060. What an amazing thing that these things perhaps speak to us of. Okay, let's come back to Revelation 10. I'm not sure if that was helpful or unhelpful, but certainly, if nothing else, let's take from it that before long, we believe the angel will sound, time no longer, no more delays, time's up, and we've got to make sure that we are ready and prepared. So verse 7 of Revelation 10, we read, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he's declared to his servants the prophets. So when do we read about the seventh angel sounding? Look in your margin, next to verse 7, and I'm sure you'll have chapter 11 and verse 15. So the seventh angel, when he sounds his trumpet, and we've seen, haven't we, the six trumpets of the barbarians, then the rise of Islam. We saw the fall of Rome in 476 at the time of the fourth trumpet. We saw the, fourth, the, the fall of Constantinople in 1453 at the time of the sixth trumpet, but the seventh trumpet, Revelation 11 and verse 15, is the time when Rome will finally be totally destroyed and the kings of this world will become the kings of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So verse 7 of Revela Revelation 10. The days of the voice of the seventh angel haven't yet sounded, obviously. And verse 8, the voice which I heard from heaven spake to me again and said, Go, take the little book which, op which is open in the hand of the angel, which stands on the sea and on the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And so John is given this little book. Amazing, isn't it? That the, the, the way this vision is unfolding before him, and he takes this little book and he says to me, take it and eat it up. Now, can you think of any other Old Testament prophets that had to eat up the book or a book or a scroll? Ezekiel. Ezekiel? Any others? Who's before Ezekiel? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So let's have a look at both of them. Should we go, uh, keep a marker, let's go to Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15, and you remember in verse 16, let's go to verse 15 for connection, so Jeremiah 15 verse 15, O Lord thou knowest, Remember me, visit me, revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I suffer rebuke. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So Jeremiah did. What about another that uh, gave us Ezekiel? Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 3. We've looked here already, haven't we, in our studies. So Ezekiel 3 verse 1, Ezekiel told, Son of man, eat that which you find, eat this roll, and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Now, I can remember as a little boy thinking, well, it's not that bad, having to eat a roll. Uh, 
But we understand, don't we, that the roll isn't a bread roll, as my um, stomach likes to imagine. Rather, it's the scroll, isn't it? It's the scroll that was given to him in verse 9 of chapter 2. Do you remember where we read about a few weeks ago, the roll of a book? It's the scroll, isn't it? So he said to me, verse 3 of chapter 3, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. And I ate it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So Ezekiel 3 and verse 3, we read that Ezekiel eats the scroll and it's as honey for sweetness. And here, John, when he eats the little book, it tastes like honey to him. Now, some good references of the honey, which is clearly speaking to us about God's word, it tastes so good, would be Psalm 19. So let's go to Psalm 19, or you, I'll go there if you like, and you guys can make a note. Psalm 19, um, Psalm 19, verse 10, we read, or verse 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb so isn't it interesting that the psalmist is telling us about the judgments of Yahweh they're true and righteous altogether sweeter than honey so the judgments that now the rainbow angel is bringing onto the world they're sweeter than honey they're altogether righteous Another reference is in Proverbs. Proverbs 24. Let me just turn there. Proverbs 24 and verse 13 and 14. Where Solomon's inspired to write, My son, eat thou honey because it's good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. So as John eats this little book that's given to him, oh, it tastes like honey. It's the knowledge of wisdom. He's seen the judgments, the righteous judgments of God in the seven thunders being uttered. And it tastes as sweet as honey. And yet, he's eaten this. And although in his mouth, it tastes as sweet as honey. We read at the end of verse 10. As soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. And so I challenged us for homework last week to reflect on why that might be the case why would it move from this sweetness as he sees the righteous judgments of god coming upon the earth to a bitter taste in his belly why might that be the case any thoughts in here not that we dare to to say out loud well, the suggestion is, and which I think is utterly reasonable, that quite clearly the work is not done. Sin and death still exist. And as John tastes the little book and he sees the righteous acts of God, unfolding before him he's not allowed to write them down but he's seen it and it tastes so good sadly even in the millennium at the beginning of this millennial age that's going to begin to unfold the problem of sin still exists death still exists and so there's a bitterness in his belly which will remain until the problem of sin is utterly done away with. 
until sin and death are destroyed, which won't be for another thousand years or so until the end of the millennium period. And so, verse 11, he said to me, you must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. And so what's verse 11 speaking to us of? This is our job. The role of the saints, of which John is one. Yes, you might have that bitter feeling in your belly because you now can see, John, that the problem of sin hasn't been dealt with. But your role now, is to go out to the people, the nations, the tongues, to kings. You've got to go out to the whole world to prophesy and to speak of the things of the truth. And so we think, don't we, back uh, something like in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, where we read, don't we, of all the world needing to be full of the glory of the Lord, as the waters covering the sea. This is the role now of the saints, to make the world full of the glory of the Lord. We've got to go to prophesy to peoples, nations, and tongues. In Isaiah chapter 2, a good reference, Isaiah 2, verse 2 to 4, where we read, don't we, of the word of the Lord going out of Jerusalem. This is us. It doesn't, you know, the, the picture in Isaiah 2 is of it flowing out of Jerusalem. But it's not that, it, you know, it, the word of the Lord just drifts along on the rivers. It happens through us. Uh, let's just quickly turn to Revelation 14. And verses 6 and 7 is what this is speaking of. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. We'll look at the, the symbology of this when we study the chapter together. We, we saw, uh, rather he saw, another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach that, to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea, and the fountains of waters. And so the fountain of waters, which will take the word of God, as it were, from Jerusalem out to the nations, the everlasting gospel is going to be preached. And so Revelation 10 and verse 11 finishes with that beautiful picture. Now, I said, didn't I, that I would, uh, if we had time, how are we doing, folks? Are you okay? Can we do another 10 minutes? Can we go till nine o'clock? Yeah, my guys in here are okay, so you're going to be okay as well. I'm going to whip through some slides, which um, I'm going to suggest that perhaps you get a camera ready to photograph as we go, because we're not going to go into the details of most of these slides. But I want to give you a picture of the work of the Rainbow Angel. So the Rainbow Angel, we believe, begins in Sinai. And we, we feel that, those of you who were here when we studied um, Revelation 19, because we were finishing Revelation at the beginning of lockdown, and of course we've come back, but you can find online the class of Revelation 19, you'll see that we looked then at why we believe that the judgment takes place in Sinai, in the Sinai Desert. And these references help us with that, uh, where we see that the Raymond Angel begins from the time of the judgment, and it now goes out from Sinai. And uh, we see initially the desert peoples, the, the Arab peoples, being quick to bow the knee. The, those Isaiah references in Psalm 72 and Habakkuk 3 talk to us about these Arab nations or these Arab people, the Bedouin, that so quickly recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're not surprised, are we? When we're seeing many uh, Iranian brethren and sisters, in fact, I had a lovely message uh, this week from our brother Neil McQueen from Esslingen in Germany, who sent me a message from a brother in Pakistan, um, who said that many of the Pakistani brethren and sisters really enjoyed looking at Revelation 9 because they could see 
um, uh, the, 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 the scriptural record talking about Islam uh, and its role within um, uh, the, the history unfolding and the demise of the Roman Empire. So uh, it's interesting that many brethren and sisters are converting or have been converted from Islam as they recognize the truth of the scriptures and that salvation can be found in no other man save the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those people who have nothing to do with the doctrine of the Trinity, they believe in one God, are so quick to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. And so the rainbow angel begins, and it going out from Sinai, uh, and moving out into uh, Egypt, Isaiah 19 tells us, where the king of the north has already gone down and been to. The rainbow angel will go into Egypt, and then the, the highway begins to be prepared, the way of holiness, where a highway will be set up all the way from Egypt and right the way north up into Assyria. That um, many of the outcasts of Israel may begin to return as they start to, to hear the rumours of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, the rainbow angel thundering in these regions. Of course, the main mission of the rainbow angel will be to go to save the tents of Judah. Zechariah chapter 12, we're told that he will go to save the tents of Judah first. We know, don't we, that the Gogian confederacy will have surrounded Jerusalem, and yet... The, the Raymond angel will start to march up to Jerusalem. Lift up your head, Psalm 24 says. O ye gates, lift ye up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And we're going to come up. The Raymond angel will march up through the Sinai Peninsula, um, up through the king's highway. In fact, you can drive today on the king's highway that goes through the territory of Jordan or Edom and Moab, up through Bosra, Isaiah 63, and we will march, or Isaiah 34 talks to us about the battles in Bosra. We've seen already, Zechariah chapter 9, that the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Hebrew word is Teman. It's here from the south of Sinai that will march up. We'll come to try to save, or not to try, we will save the tents of Judah, but not before half of the city, Zechariah 14, we read, will have been taken. Many will have been already taken into captivity. Jerusalem will be, uh, have been laid siege to. The Gogian Confederacy will surround Jerusalem. Half the city will have gone. The old part of the city, I believe, will be left as the Gogian Confederacy waves their fist Isaiah 10 talks to us, at those dwelling in Zion. Jerusalem will be a burner and stone for all people. Um, the likes of Elijah, I feel, will have gone before, perhaps others too with him, saying to Zion, get to the high mountain. Just look on the map there. We know from Joel 3 that the valley of Jehoshaphat is key to the battle of Armageddon, of course, it will spread right across the mountains of Israel uh, and, and throughout the territory. But the Valley of Jehoshaphat, Joel 3, gives us a key location. But the high point of Zion, it's the highest point. So when it says Zion, get to the high mountain. Look on the map. Zion is the high mountain that they will climb up to. Uh, and they, half the city will be destroyed and many will be holding on. But inside Jerusalem, Elijah and those with him will be saying, don't be afraid. Behold, your God, the Lord God will come with strong hand. His arm will rule for him. His reward is with him and his work before him. And so we read in Revelation 16 of the way of the kings of the east being prepared. Ezekiel 43 tells us that we will be coming from the way of the east. What's the way of the east? Look at Jerusalem. Where do we come? If we're coming from the east, which mountain is on the east of Jerusalem? Olives. The Mount of Olives. And so we'll come on to the Mount of Olives. The Son of Righteousness, Malachi 4 talks to us of, doesn't it? We've looked at already tonight. 
rising in the east. And when we come, we'll come, and I believe that initially we'll be hidden. We've just got a couple of minutes. Will you come to Zechariah chapter 14? I think this is a special picture that we're shown. So let's just have a look there. I appreciate we're sort of moving at an incredible pace, but we don't need to look at all these things. You can look at them in your own time. You can play back this record and just press pause and look at those slides. We're trying to get a big picture of what's taking place, of the rainbowed angel's work. In Zechariah 14, we know that the earthquake will go when the Lord Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives. But we're told in verse 5, that as the people flee by the valley of the mountains, they'll flee like in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And then we read that all the Lord will, God will come and all the saints with him, that's us, the rainbow angel, and it shall come to pass, verse 6, in that day, that the light shall not be clear nor dark. Now I've put on the screen there that the revised version margin tells us this. There shall not be light the bright ones shall contract themselves. In Habakkuk chapter 3, which also deals with the rainbow angel's work, we read that his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his, uh, his hands. Actually, that word horn simply means rays, like rays of light. And there was the hiding of his power. So there's this hiding of the bright ones. Now, uh, this week... Um, many of us have read the book of Judges. Can you tell me a battle in the book of Judges where the lights had to be hidden? Gideon. Gideon, right? The book of, well, not the book of Judges, the story of Gideon. And I wonder that that's the picture now, as the saints will surround Jerusalem and the, our light, as it were, will be hidden before the, the trumpet sounds and the, uh, immediately the, the battle ensues and the, the hosts of Gog will fight against each other. Do you remember the story of Gideon where it said every man's sword was set against his fellow in Judges 7? And that's exactly what's going to happen here. The mighty earthquake's going to go on the Mount of Olives, and every man's sword will be set against his fellow. Interesting news article from February of last year. Israel is hundreds of years overdue a massive earthquake. So that's what's going to happen. The Ezekiel 38 talks to us of a massive earthquake that will throw every wall and steep place to the ground. And just note out what else you read in Ezekiel 38. I will call for a sword against him throughout my mouth, said the Lord. Every man's sword against his brother. That's what happened in the battle with Gideon. And that's what will happen here. That the Gogian confederacy will fight against each other as then God's judgments of rain, of hailstones, of fire and brimstone, just as he overthrew the Assyrian at the time of Hezekiah. So those very judgments will be used to destroy the latter-day Assyrian at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah 14, the most horrendous pictures show. Their flesh, their flesh will consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will consume away in their holes. Their tongue will consume in their mouth. And his hand will rise up against the hand of his neighbour. And so our job will be to get the people out of Jerusalem. And yet for all of that, the Lord God says that we should bring comfort, comfort to those in Jerusalem who've held on. And there'll be many within the rainbow angel whose job will be to get those who faithfully held on in the city of Jerusalem as they now come to recognize the one whom they've pierced and mourn for him. So they will be saved. The tents of Judah will be saved. And it's at that point, I think, in history, or in the future, that the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together.
So finally, come to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, where we read, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. That's Israel. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. That's the picture that we now see of the Lord Jesus Christ revealing himself to Israel and uh, in time to the world. So Revelation 10 is an amazing chapter in showing to us the march of the rainbowed angel. So if we want to remember what Revelation 10 is about, perhaps our chapter heading is the march of the rainbowed angel. So, let's finish with a chilly challenge. Um, chapter 11, let me tell you now, is one of Revelation's toughest chapters. So we've got to come with our game faces on next week. And uh, we've got to really get in the zone and focus. And uh, we'll try and get through the chapter. But, um, yeah, and you might say, well, Pete, why don't you just split the chapters in half? What I feel is, is that for any that want to look at these classes again, it's just easier for them if they can find Revelation chapter 9 and they can listen to 10 minutes and stop. And then, you know, but, but for them, they know where they can very quickly find each chapter. So that's why we're trying to do a chapter a week. Who knows? Halfway through chapter 11 next week, I might be giving up and saying, we're going to split chapter 11. But we'll give it a go and see how we get on. So a bit of homework. Chapter 11, verse 8. What is the great city being referred to? You, you, taking a photograph of this, how was Jesus crucified at this place? Chapter 11, verse 10. What is the great earthquake at the end of this period? What might the tenth part of the city be that falls? And 11, verse 9. This is a real toughie for those of you who don't know it. The three and a half days relates to 105 years. How? And we'll come again to this idea of decorum of the symbol, that we're given that very specific symbol for very specific purpose. Mm -hmm.